All right. Hopefully, everything's functioning. We'll see. Um, all right. In fact, I'm going to just double check here, make sure. Okay. Oh, we got. All right. Okay. So, this seems like a kind of a theme that. Why do you have to talk about that? Why do you have to? Why is it important to discuss the cause of sin? After the Augsburg Confession goes through all of these different progressions, we've already dealt with original sin, right? Original sin, the fall, that was all the way back in um, Article 2. <laughs> so now we're at Article 19, and we come back to the idea of sin, but it's dealing now here with the cause of sin. Well. The reason for this is it follows up Article 18 on free will. Okay, so free will and the cause of sin kind of go hand in hand, really, when you think about it. But it also has to, uh, has to be dealt with because you end up with these philosophical arguments, right? If God would have created Adam and Eve without free will, well, then they wouldn't have sinned. So it's God's fault. <laughs> See, this is, this is what humans like to do. What do we like to do? We take the blame and we put it on somebody else, right? Adam says, oh, it was Eve's fault. Eve says, eh, it was Satan's fault, right? We pass the buck. We don't like when we are guilty and so we try to find a way out from under it. Uh, the Augsburg Confession, Article 19, doesn't allow for that. Puts it squarely back on us as being at fault, not on the Lord. So, Article 19, the cause of sin. Our churches teach that although God creates and preserves nature, the cause of sin is located in the will of the wicked, that is, the devil the ungod and ungodly people. Without God's help, this will turns itself away from God. As Christ says, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. And of course, who is Jesus speaking of there? Satan, right? When Satan lies, when the devil lies, he speaks out of his own character. He is a deceiver, and so he deceives. All right, very short article, really, right? There's not a lot there. What could we possibly have to talk about? Well, uh, we do have at least some things we need to cover here. Uh, it will not be the longest class we have. Next week will be longer because next week we deal with Article 20 on good works and just reading it is going to be a little bit longer because Article 20 goes through a lot more explanation because <laughs> justification is done without good works, right? Without our good works. So what role do good works have? Well, it's going to spell that out. That's our uh, preview for next week. So uh, Leif Grane in his... Uh, book on the Augsburg Confession writes, this article is tied to the previous one. Its purpose is to prevent any possibility of blaming the reformers for making God the cause of sin. Thus, its primary uh, purpose is negative. The AC, Augsburg Confession, does not seriously attempt to explain the origin of sin, no, nor to go beyond what can be read in Scripture. Article 2 refers to the fall. Here, there is no attempt to elaborate further on original sin. Pretty good approach to Scripture when you think about it, or to explaining the things of God, really. Uh, the Augsburg Confession does not attempt to explain the origin of sin, or, nor to go beyond what can be read in Scripture. <laughs> huh, yeah, that's our approach, isn't it? What does Scripture say? That's what we'll say. But 
what about this thought that I have of explaining things? Scripture doesn't say it, but, but it seems to rationally make sense to me. It must be this way. And as Lutherans, we can say, hmm, nah, could be, but you know what? We don't know because we don't go beyond Scripture. We stick with the Word of God. Where the Word of God speaks, we speak beyond that. Where God is silent, ultimately we have to remain silent. This is free, freeing, really, when you think about it. Can you imagine having to try to explain everything? I've actually had, uh, had conversations with some other Christians um, that they would have a question about a, a given thing and they would say, well, what, what, does, uh, what does the Lutheran Church teach about this? And I would say, we don't really have a stand on that. <laughs> well, how, how can you not? Well, because Scripture's not really giving us anything specifically uh, that, that speaks to that. So we don't know. Well, well, surely some somebody has studied this and figured, no, no, they, Scripture doesn't say, so we don't know. That's it. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, pretty clear. Okay. So I, I really love how uh, Johann Gerhard lays this out in uh, his theological commonplace. Uh, <laughs> he starts with, this is his headings, or at least as it's translated into English, because I don't speak Latin or German, and so I rely on the, uh, the English translations here. But the original happiness of man, that's, that's the title in this serious, serious, you know, book of theology, right? The conclusion to the six days of creation is most beautiful. God saw all things which he had made, and behold, they were very good. Job 38.7, all the sons of God shouted for joy, and the mount, uh, morning stars praised him. All creatures were standing in their own order and were declaring the goodness, wisdom, and power of himself. Man knew, knew God the creator. So, in the beginning, everything was as it ought to be. Okay, so when it speaks of order, that is, how did God order things? How did God arrange things to be? And in the beginning... Everything was correct. It was working the way it was supposed to. It was the way it was designed. And you had the original happiness of man. There was complete happiness because we were content with who we were, who we were created to be. We knew God. God knew us. We had peace with God, peace with creation. As Genesis says, it was very good, right? Uh, Gerhard goes on. The clear light of divine knowledge shone in his mind. Equipped by the love of God, his will was perfect. Can you imagine having a perfect will in knowing God's will perfectly? Not even having to think about it. Like, whatever I think to do is going to be in accord with God's will, and I just do it. I mean, God is bringing that about in us by the work of the Holy Spirit, but we're a long way from it at this point. There was no inclination, inclination to vice, no aberration from the law in the powers of his soul or in the members of his body. Man would speak with God in familiar fashion. He rejoiced in him. He lived in the utmost peace of mind and in a most abundant affluence of all things. Right? The original happiness of man. It was good. And then, I love this. This is the next title, How It Turned Out Miserably. <laughs> so, Gerhard has these titles for the sections. <laughs> the original happiness of man, how it turned out miserably. <laughs> so, Gerhard writes, Therefore, someone looking upon the cursed earth, and man, sold under sin and subject to miseries of every type, might with good reason cry out with the servants of the householder, in Matthew 13, 27, Lord, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? Right? This makes sense. You look around the world, you're like, wait, if God is good, then why? 
right? This world is messed up. There's all kinds of wickedness. So, you know, just using our natural senses, we might look around the world and go, man, did God do this? Gerhard goes on. But the father of the household responds to the servants in the same chapter. An enemy has done this. The same response is given by Moses, the one who wrote about the primeval condition in Genesis chapter 3, the sum of which is that seducing devil and man falling away from God, introducing sin and every evil into the world. So, who brought evil into the world? Who brought sin into the world? Was it God? No. It was Satan. Okay. I, I love how Gerhard uses that uh, that parable, right? This the uh, the wheat and the tares. You know? Master, what what happened here? You know, didn't you sow good seed, right? God, didn't you create the world good? How then is there evil in this world? Well, an enemy has done this, and that's that's exactly what it is for us too, isn't it? An enemy has done this. An enemy. Uh, tempted Adam and Eve. And yeah, it turned out miserably because they gave in to that temptation. But the original introduction of that comes not from God, but from Satan. All right, so did God cause man to fall into sin? No, absolutely not, right? This is not God's fault. Again, what do we like to do? We like to shift the blame. I don't like it when I'm guilty, so I try to put the blame on somebody else. Well, God, it's your fault. It's your fault that there's sin in the world. You could have prevented this, right? So we're going to deal with some of the questions that people have or ways in which people try to shift the blame. All right, so here's one objection. God could have kept Adam from sinning. Could he have kept Adam from sinning? Of course he could. God can do anything. But does that make it God's fault? It's like, <laughs> if you put cookies on the counter and you tell your kids not to eat the cookies, and they eat the cookies, that's not your fault that they ate the cookies. If you tell your grown-up child no, you're not allowed to borrow my car, and they borrow your car anyway, that's not your fault, it's their fault, right? So, I like how uh, uh, Gerhard deals with this too. God gave mankind a sound will. God added the threat of death as a warning. God had no obligation to use some violent hindrance to hold back the hand of Eve from touching the tree, because God is obliged to no one. Nor was this proper, because sin would not yet have been restrained if, with her hand restrained, her will nonetheless burned with sinful desires. Okay, so can you could could God have stopped Eve from grabbing that fruit? Yeah, but already what happened? Her will was already turned. Sin was already there. When the will is contrary to what God has designed you to do, that is sin already. So, um, you know, this happens in parenting. Sometimes you can create a correct behavior, <laughs> but changing the actual thought process, the mindset, um, isn't so easy, is it? This is why gospel parenting shapes children over a long period of time, but it's not as quick as law parenting. <laughs> and there's got to be both, of course, law, right? But that, that gospel, we want them to grow to desire to do what God would have them do. Uh, not just, well, I'm not doing this because it's the, against the rules, right? I want to do what God would have me. Okay, 
Therefore, Gerhard goes on, uh, Ursinus, who is somebody I had never heard of, and I had to look up and go, oh, okay, he was some kind of reformer too. Uh, <laughs> Ursinus uh, himself is correct. Not hindering is not the same thing as willing, but is permitting and also, uh, and, and also at the same time, not willing insofar as those things which he does uh, which he does not hinder displease him god does not hinder the fall of man because he knows how to draw something good from it nevertheless it does not happen because he wanted the fall itself but rather he wanted the good which he knew how to draw from the fall However, the fall itself he hates and detests very much. Okay, so the fact that God didn't hinder that thing doesn't mean he wanted that thing to happen. But it also goes on, God still uses that bad thing to bring about a good thing. Because that's what God does, right? All right, next objection God didn't create human beings as being unable to sin. See, God, it's your fault. If you would have created human beings unable to sin, then we wouldn't have sinned. All right, how do we address that? Well, God created man with free will, but not with the desire to sin. This is again from, from Gerhard. And then he quotes Augustine. The nature uh, which is man in such a way that it is not able to sin if it so wishes, is not evil. And that nature which sins by will and not by necessity is justly punished. So if you're not able to sin, are you then actually um, doing that which God would have you do simply out of compulsion? Or are you doing it because you desire to do that? Um, so, if you're not able, if you're if you're unable to sin, then how how um, how amazing is it then if you don't sin? It, it, it's not, right? When we are capable of sinning, and then we choose not to do that, that is a miracle. <laughs> that is an amazing thing. And, as we know, only is really capable of happening after the fall by the power of the Holy Spirit. But Adam and Eve, pre-fall, had the ability to sin, but also had the ability not to sin. So their obedience to God, up until the point that they do sin, was truly uh, something that was God-pleasing. Okay, I like how uh, um, uh, St. Basil uh, addresses this too. You do not consider your servants faithful and fruitful if, bound by chains and fetters, they do what you command, but rather only if they do what is their duty spontaneously and freely. In the same way, anything that has been forced and squeezed out by some violence is in no way acceptable to God, but rather anything that proceeds from genuine virtue. Moreover, virtue stems from choosing, not from necessity, and choosing and decision require a freedom of choice. So, what's he saying? If you're only doing it because you're being forced to do it, well, then you're not doing it spontaneously and freely. It's not really obedience to God. It's just being forced to do it. But when we do the things God has called us to do out of willing spirit, that truly honors the Lord. All right, another objection. <clears throat> God didn't maintain man in goodness. Again, what are we trying to do? Shift the blame. Not my fault, it's God's fault, right? So, how do we address that? Well, here's what Gerhardt says. 
by nature. Man could not be immutable in goodness because only God himself, God is himself such goodness, essentially, and thus immutably good. For every created thing is mutable. What does mutable mean? Able to change, able to be changed. Okay? He ought not be immutable in goodness by grace because the reward is not given before the battle. And no crown is given except to the victor. Thus, God wanted free obedience first to be given to him by man before he would confirm him in good. Okay, so uh, only later is this added as a gift of God, but in the creation itself, God does not um, create man unable to sin, uh, does not create man you know, as, as being immutable, unable to be changed, uh, because, well, it's a, man is a created thing. Only God in and of himself is immutable. Everything else can be changed. Now, God later can and will give us an immutable spirit so that we will no longer be able to sin in the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, Augustine addresses it this way. He could have done so because he is omnipotent. <laughs> right? This is the, could God create a rock so big that he couldn't lift it? This is that question, right? Well, yes, and then he would lift it because, well, God could do anything he wants. Yeah. So, uh, is God omnipotent? Yes. He is able to do anything. He is all-powerful. Uh, why did he not do it? Because he did not want to. <laughs> I just love Augustine with this because this is, this is parenting right here. Why? Because I said so. Well, you didn't tell me why. I don't have to tell you why I'm the parent, right? Now, there comes a time where it's best to explain things to your children, but here's the thing. We are creatures. God is God. God owes us no explanation. He's not accountable to me. I'm accountable to him. So, <laughs> why did he not do it? Because he did not want to. <laughs> that is enough of an answer right there. But he goes on. Uh, why did he not want to? God himself uh, did not want to. We should not know. Uh, we should not know more than is necessary. Furthermore, I think that the rational creature, which avoids evil contention with evil things, is of great goodness. So, um, God has told us that which is necessary. There's a lot of things He doesn't tell us, and that. A lot of things we would like to know, right? How many, how many times have you had the conversation? When you get to heaven, what's the first question you have for God? People say that kind of thing all the time, right? When I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to ask God is? Do you have one? Anybody? Nobody wants to actually say it. <laughs> but a lot of people have these things that they're... I want to ask God that. Okay? Now, here's the thing. He doesn't have to tell you there either. <laughs> that might not be very satisfying to you. But it's true. It's true. God does not owe you anything, does he? Even in the resurrection, he does not owe you an explanation. He may give it to you. He may not. God is God, right? Right? And we are not. And when we operate from that perspective, hey, we're operating the way in which God designed things to be. We are creature. He is creator. All right. <clears throat> it has no power without the Holy Spirit to work the righteousness of God that is spiritual righteousness. Um, so, 
Uh, wait, oh, yeah, this is from last time. I don't. What, how did this? This one snuck through. I didn't de delete it apparently. So never mind. Okay, <laughs> ignore that one. That one's not supposed to be here. That was from last time. Well, I don't care. I'm skipping it. <laughs> because I am teacher <laughs> and you are student. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so this is the last, uh, the last slide that we have, but I love the way Martin Chemnitz summarizes this uh, in, in his Loki, um, just, just really uh, a wonderful summary here. So, we must note that it means to say, and he's talking specifically about um, Article 19 here, we must note that what it means to say uh, that God is not the cause of sin. He does not will or approve of sin nor does he force our wills to commit sin. For certain people understand that he is not the author of sin because in the beginning he did not create sin, nor does he have sin in himself, nor does he of himself commit sin. But yet they believe that men do sin by the will of God and that God, not only in a permissive, but also in an effective sense, works sin in and through men. But still, he cannot be called the author of sin. So, does God, okay, did God will and bring about sin in the beginning? No. Does God will and bring about sin in the present? No. God is immutable. <laughs> he is unchanging, right? We are mutable. We change. So, Martin Chemnitz says, God is good. There is no sin in him. He does not commit sin. The sin which is in the world is not a thing which was established in the beginning by God, nor was sin ordained by him. But sin entered the world through the spite of the devil. An enemy has done this, right? So, what do we take away from this? I think one thing we take away from this is God is God and we are not. And when we live from that, it's a whole lot more comfortable we can stop having to ask so many questions and we can just say, well, God's got it in control. We, one, of the, one of the things, especially us uh, as Westerners, what do we like? We like answers. <laughs> and God does not always give us answers. Sometimes he does when it's necessary for those things of salvation he certainly has right but there are a lot of things he doesn't give us the answer to and he does not even indicate that he will give us the answer to those things and that's okay because God is God and I'm not uh, but also we need to take away from this the reality God did not bring sin into the world we look at the wreck that we have around us why is it why is the world the way that it is an enemy has done this, right? And then you go back to Article 2, Original Sin, and <laughs> we've contributed to it, right? So where is the guilt? Go back to Genesis 3, Satan, Adam, Eve. Us. <laughs> and yet, God in his goodness doesn't say, yeah, I know, the world's a mess. You guys really messed it up. Have fun with that. But he comes into the world to redeem the world so that by faith in Christ we can have redemption. We can have restoration. We can have everlasting life. So God does not cause sin, but he puts an end to it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, you know, the, the, old, uh, the old saying, 
I didn't start the fight, but I will end it. Uh, God did not bring sin into the world, but he does put an end to it. All right, comments, questions, thoughts? I covered it perfectly. Sweet. Okay, okay. Um, this is one of our shorter ones. Next week is not, as I indicated earlier, next week, Article 20, Good Works. And it's a lot longer, and there's a lot to talk about with it. So uh, probably will be a little bit longer class next week. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are good. That though we sinned, you sent your Son into the world to redeem us and to restore all creation. We thank you that though an enemy has been at work, you also are at work in this world to bring about salvation and restoration. Uh, we ask that you would remind us that you are God and we are not, and that we can rest in that, uh, not fighting against it, but resting in that knowing you are good, you are omnipotent, you are all-powerful, and that you have all things in control even when we can't see it as such. As we look around at the evil in this world, we grieve the pain and the suffering, but we give thanks that in Christ there is restoration, hope, and healing. Continue to direct our eyes to Christ, that we would be reminded of the Savior that we have and the hope that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.